Hi, I'm Shashank Bhargav and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express news show. This week on the show, we are taking a look at the year gone by and trying to assess what lies ahead for us in 2024. So far, we have talked about the narratives that dominated Indian politics and the factors that led to India's surprising economic growth this year. But today, we will talk about the biggest geopolitical and diplomatic events that India had to deal with in 2023. To tell us about these challenges, we are joined by Indian Express's Diplomatic Affairs Editor, Shubhajit Roy. Shubhajit, as someone who has been reporting on diplomatic affairs for some time now, how would you describe the international affairs of 2023? Well, you know, to put this in this year in context, in 2022, we said that that was one of the most disruptive eras after Second World War because Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022. At that point of time, if you remember, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had told the Russian president Vladimir Putin that this is not the era of war. And yet, a year later, 2023, became actually a year of wars. Fighting between Russia, Ukraine, soon going to enter its third year, and the ongoing war in the Gaza Strip, which uh, was triggered by Hamas's October 7th attacks, is now among the most destructive conflicts of recent decades. We have breaking news out of Israel this morning where Hamas has launched a surprise attack within Israel's borders overnight. First, launching rockets from the Gaza Strip, then sealing militants into the streets of the southern part of Israel. Israel has formally declared war after that unprecedented multi-pronged terror attack from Hamas. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says more than 22,000 people have been killed and tens of thousands more remain injured. So in that sense, looking ahead, you know, there are other conflicts around the world as well, which has created tension. And uh, China's sort of belligerence or some call it assertiveness has not really reduced. And uh, that worries India, that has worried the West and is testing the waters in 2023. And looking forward, looking ahead, they pose present clear challenges. Right, and besides this, there were also a number of diplomatic challenges that India had to tackle this year. So let's start talking about them from west to east, starting with Canada. We know that relations between the two countries had been tense already, but they really hit an all-time low when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in the Canadian Parliament said that there were credible allegations that the Indian government may have links to the assassination of Khalistani leader Hardeep Singh Nijhar. Over the past number of weeks, Canadian security agencies have been actively pursuing credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijar. Any involvement of a foreign government in the killing of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is an unacceptable violation of our sovereignty. It is contrary... Shubhajit, remind our listeners the extent to which this affected our ties with Canada. Well, after the Kanishka, you know, bombing incident in the 80s, when ties between India and Canada really was at a low point, I think after that, after almost more than 40 years, this is again a low point in the diplomatic ties between the two countries. Because uh, this kind of an allegation which was sort of leveled by the Canadian Prime Minister on Indian government's potential link to an assassination in Canada has impacted the relationship. We saw expulsion of diplomats, we saw visa curbs, and uh, so uh, there has been sort of rhetoric from both sides talking at each other, and that has sort of impacted the ties. Although, I mean, in this case, India has also tried to walk back on some of the visa curves that it imposed last year, essentially. And uh, there is a fear that the reduction of staff, diplomatic staff in the Canadian High Commission in India might impact the visa processing times 
for Indian students who go there to study. So overall, however, investments from Canada have been there and there is no, so far, no pull out of investments, but trade talks have been paused. So all in all, this is a massive stress test for the India-Canada diplomatic ties. Right. And now moving on from Canada, let's talk about its neighbor, the United States. I mean, this was the year that PM Modi visited the US and met with President Joe Biden. But later in the year, similar to what happened in Canada, there were again allegations of an Indian official being involved in an assassination plot against Khalistani leader Gurpatwan Singh Pannun. And while in Canada's case, India completely dismissed the allegations and called them baseless, here India took them a bit more seriously. Tell us how something like this affects the ties between India and the US, which have had a long-standing partnership. Yeah, I mean, India-US relationship has really grown from strength to strength over the last two, two and a half decades. And it's been an ongoing process. And it's been years and decades of hard work by both sides, from people to people level to strategic level now. The sort of broad arc of the relationship has deepened. But this particular case where an Indian official has been accused of plotting an assassination of an American citizen who also holds a Canadian passport, Canadian citizenship, and is a Khalistani separatist in the U.S. This assassination plot has really is cast a shadow on the ties because the Indian side has also responded differently, as you rightly pointed out, because the allegations are serious. There is an indictment that has been filed in a New York court and uh, the investigations, the papers that have been filed, which are in the public domain, uh, really give a lot of details about how the assassination was being plotted. And uh, an unnamed Indian official was possibly uh, running the operation. As regards the case against an individual that has been filed in a U.S. court, uh, allegedly linking him to an Indian official, this is a matter of concern. We have said, and uh, let me reiterate, that this is also contrary to government policy. The nexus between organized crime, trafficking, gun running, uh, and extremists um, at an international level is a serious issue for law enforcement uh, agencies and organizations to consider. And it is precisely for that reason that a high-level inquiry committee has been constituted, and we will obviously be guided by its results. I've seen a series of questions. That Indian government questions. obviously has taken these inputs, as they like to call it, and not allegations in case like they call it with Canada. So Indian government's response has been much more serious. In fact, the prime minister has expressed India's commitment to the rule of law in an interview. And he has, at the highest level, promised to look into the role of Indian citizens in the alleged U.S. plot if information is provided. In fact, a high-level probe committee is looking into the issue. And many have pointed out to U.S. President Joe Biden's unavailability for the Republic Day parade uh, as the chief guest for the Republic Day celebrations as one of the impact or fallout of this controversy. But uh, in the long term, the relationship is pretty strategic, pretty strong. The two sides cooperate from as the last joint statement pointed out when President Biden was here, from sea to stars. With this visit, we're demonstrating once more how India and the United States are collaborating on nearly every human endeavor and delivering progress across the board. For from designing new ways to diagnose and treat illnesses like cancer and diabetes, to collaborating on human spaceflight, including sending an Indian astronaut to the International Space Station in 2024, to accelerating the global clean energy transition and tackling climate, the climate crisis we face. To harnessing our shared... So essentially, cooperation from space to defense to nuclear technology to AI, quantum computing, to, you know, students uh, going there for uh, higher education, to people... Indian professionals working there to earn a living or Indian tourists visiting the U.S. So the relationship is really broad and deep. So in the long term, it's unlikely to sort of impact 
in a big way. But yes, there's a short term, there are headwinds that uh, the bilateral ties are facing due to these allegations of an Indian official link to the assassination plot. Okay, and Shubhajit, now let's move over to the Middle East. You talked about it in the beginning. It has been nearly three months since the latest war between Israel and Hamas began. There have been over 22,000 casualties, a lot of them women and children. It's a huge humanitarian crisis. But tell us, how does India view this crisis and what are the fallouts it finds concerning? Well, you know, if you saw the Indian response in the first few days till the time uh, now, it has evolved over a period of time. So initially, the response from the Prime Minister himself was a complete support to Israel against terror attack, against this terrorist incident by Hamas on October 7th. And uh, he conveyed the same sentiment when uh, he spoke to Benjamin Netanyahu. But India also nuanced its position as the conflict had uh, multiple sides and the uh, Palestinian side was not overlooked after the first few days. And there was a balancing of sorts because the Arab world was watching India's response very carefully. And India has very strategic partnership with the Arab world, Saudi, UAE, and uh, other countries in the region, as well as Israel. There is an universal obligation, I think, to observe international humanitarian law. There is also a global responsibility to fight the menace of terrorism in all its forms and manifestations. And I think that um, accurately sums up how we look at this uh, position. First look at Operation... So it has tried to nuance its position and balance between the two sides without getting into the conflict. In fact, in the last vote at the UN General Assembly, India voted for ceasefire as well, which it had refrained from for first two months. So there has been an evolution because also because there's been a realization that India doesn't want to alienate either of the sides. And it doesn't want, most importantly, for the conflict to spread across the region because there are about 90 lakh Indians who live and work there in this region, in these countries, and in the West Asian region. And India doesn't want these Indian citizens to be impacted, or if the conflict spreads, they might be affected. So from that perspective, India has tried to just try to balance the two sides. So we'll see this kind of uh, approach, I think, in the coming weeks and months as well. And now the Pressure is also on Israel to sort of stop the disproportionate response that it had launched through the aerial strikes because even its uh, biggest supporter, which is the US, has now started nuancing its support of the Israeli actions and the Israeli offensive in Gaza. In my meetings today with the Prime Minister and senior Israeli officials, I made clear that before Israel resumes major military operations, it must put in place humanitarian civilian protection plans that minimize further casualties of innocent Palestinians. That means taking more effective steps to protect the lives of civilians, including by clearly and precisely designating areas and places in southern and central Gaza where they can be safe and out of the line of fire. It means avoiding further significant displacement. Right, and Chubhajit, when talking about the Middle East, one major challenge for India has been in Qatar. Eight ex-Navy men had been facing the death penalty for apparent espionage charges. And this penalty was only recently reduced to jail sentences. Now, Qatar, we know, has been a friendly country. But what concerns does it raise when such a country does not immediately inform India of these charges? And also when it has taken such a long time for them to be reduced? You know, this is a sort of a individual issue. But I don't foresee this incident to be impacting india qatar relations in a major way this particular incident is unfortunate it has to be resolved at the consular level at the embassy level at the level where these charges can be challenged there has to be a judicial process and india has committed that uh, the government has committed that they will help the families of these uh, former navy personnel in challenging the verdict. So that process is on. So I would not put too much of uh, emphasis on the fact that, you know, 
this particular incident will cast a shadow on ties with Qatar. Right, and before we leave the Middle East, we'd be remiss not to talk about Kabul. It has been nearly two and a half years since Kabul fell and the Taliban took over, and we understand that India has been engaging with them. Could you talk about how India has sort of been navigating that situation? Yeah, so India obviously has stationed a technical team at its embassy in Kabul, and the official reason has been to ensure delivery of humanitarian support that India is providing to the people of Afghanistan, which is essentially food grains and medicines and books and stationery for Afghan children. But by virtue of having a team in Kabul, or one has eyes and ears in Kabul in Afghanistan, so there is a working level relationship with the current Talib regime. The the top Taliban leaders. But obviously, the Taliban has not been given recognition, diplomatic recognition by India. And India has also put the same red lines that the rest of the international community at the UN, they have insisted with the Taliban, that is not to fly the Taliban flag in India or the Afghan embassy, as well as not use the name of the Taliban government in its official correspondence while communicating with the Indian government. So these are some of the red lines that India has sort of broadly indicated. But for all practical purposes, an engagement is on between India and Taliban-run government in Kabul. Okay, now let's bring the conversation closer to home. Tensions with China continue to be there. The border standoff is nearing four years now. Tell us how big of a concern that continues to be for India, especially considering China's aggression in other places as well. I mean, this again was the year when we also saw the new government in Maldives asking India to withdraw its military personnel stationed in the country. And this government is considered close to China. So talk about how concerning that is and where we are at with China right now? Well, firstly, the India-China border standoff has been the biggest challenge that India has faced in the last couple of decades. And, you know, after years of maintaining peace and tranquility along the line of factual control, that peace and tranquility has been challenged because of 50,000 to 60,000 troops on either side being mobilized on both sides of the border with the heavy armament and equipment there stationed. And it's entering the fourth winter. So since 2020, there's been sort of some partial disengagement, but complete disengagement has not happened and a de-escalation is not in sight. So right now, obviously, that standoff has cast a shadow on the diplomatic ties. There are hardly any Indian tourists or Indian students or Chinese tourists, Chinese students. And that particular channel is completely blocked. Or even if it's there, it's hardly a trickle. So that has been a challenge. Now, this new year in 2024, there are a couple of things that to watch out for. Obviously, China's belligerence in South China Sea and the Indo-Pacific region is to be obviously noted and watched. You mentioned the change of government in Maldives, which is seen as pro-China because they came campaigning on the India Out campaign. So that is a serious concern for India. There is an abnormal position in the boundary areas, border areas uh, along the boundary. Uh, and uh, we uh, had a very frank discussion about it. It's not the first discussion. I had spoken to uh, for Mr. Chingang uh, on the sidelines of the G20 as well. Uh, so uh, uh, we have to take the disengagement process forward. And uh, uh, I have made it very clear, uh, frankly, publicly as well, and my, you know what I say within the room is not different from what I say outside, which is that India-China relations are not normal and cannot be normal if the peace and tranquility in the border areas is disturbed. I have been very, very clear. But uh, we also have to see the elections in Taiwan 
which is going to take place this month. And once we have the outcome, we'll also see how China responds. If the pro-independence political party continues in Taiwan, then there could be escalation in tension between US and China over Taiwan. And that might pose a challenge for India and impact its trade routes because about more than 50% of India's trade goods pass through South China Sea and that region. So it's going to be a challenge for India if the relationship between US and China over Taiwan, you know, it deteriorates. So these are some of the things that we have to see. And this year, there are multiple occasions for the Prime Minister and the Chinese President to meet from G20 to SCO Summit to BRICS. And one could only hope that uh, some kind of a resolution in ties in the border situation comes about and the relationship is normalized. Right, and Chubhajit, now let's talk about the other war that has been ongoing. It has now been 23 months since the Russia-Ukraine war started. For India, it had led to a lot of supply chain issues initially. But tell us where things stand at the moment. Yeah, so two years of the war and there's no end in sight. Both sides have dug in their heels, although both sides are bleeding financially. The Russians are also facing the heat in terms of their economic impact and parts of Ukraine have been controlled and captured by Russia. Parts of Ukraine have also suffered a lot of damage and destruction because of the war. Now, India is obviously also looking at this war with seeing how the two sides, uh, especially the US led the West and Russia, they come at some point, stop the war and uh, the peace returns in the region because uh, Europe is also facing a lot of challenges because of this war. The oil prices had impacted the economies across the world. Although India has been buying oil at discounted rates from Russia and has tried to you know, cushion the impact of the oil prices in India. So from that perspective, India has tried to navigate this crisis by keeping the oil supply flowing in the world, by buying oil from Russia and then supplying some of its oil to other countries. Well, the conflict in Ukraine and the sanctions on Russia have led to another surge in the cost of oil and gas. Traders are said to be struggling to sell Russian oil, even at a discount, because of difficulties in shipping and the payment process. Energy experts in the UK are warning... But the, the other key average... issue has been Russia's increasing dependence on China because of its weaker economy and weaker situation because of the war. So that is a more worrying long-term implication of the Russia-Ukraine war which India is not very comfortable with because Russia, mind you, is the largest and the biggest defense partner for India. India sources its uh, defense supplies, of almost 60 to 70 percent of its defense supplies come from Russia, which is a Soviet Union vintage. Their spare parts need to be keep coming. Although India has been trying to diversify its sources of defense uh, equipment, but it's a long, long way off. I mean, it's a long walk towards that. And uh, till that time that happens, India's dependence on Russia for defense supplies at, and if Russia is at, uh, it becomes a junior strategic partner to China, which is India's, again, strategic rival. So then essentially your biggest enemy and your biggest supplier are aligned together, then that's not good news for India, definitely. And Shubhajit, we've spoken about these major world developments, but the other big event, diplomatically speaking, that happened for India was hosting the G20 summit in New Delhi. Tell us in what way was India seeking to leverage that? Well, two broad outcomes and one which India actually tried to do was, you know, putting this world about 120 countries which are lesser developed or developing countries under the rubric and the umbrella of Global South. And that was sort of trying to put together a group, a pressure group, which are outside the G20, but are big markets or big sort of influence for the rest of the world. Whatever happens from climate change to reducing poverty to any of the global challenges cannot be done, cannot be solved, resolved or countered 
unless these 120 countries come on board. India G20 presidency has tried to give a voice to the global south. No group can claim global leadership without listening to those most affected by its decisions. Excellencies, you are meeting at a time of deep global divisions. As foreign minister, so India tried to bring them all together in this G20 and uh, by getting the African Union as a member of the G20, it sort of also got the African continent, which has about 54, 55 countries in the table with the powerful G20 economies. Now, that's one of the, I think, key takeaways from the G20 process which is now going to be implemented and taken forward by Brazil, which is going to host the G20 summit this year in 24. And the other thing that India managed to accomplish, which was seen as a very impossible situation, was the getting the West and Russians and the Chinese on the same page when it came to the joint communique of the G20 which was seen as a major diplomatic achievement by the world because till then, till then, no document had a complete consensus between Russians, Chinese, and including and led by the US and Europe. So that was a major breakthrough in India's diplomacy of 2023. And it has set a template that there is scope for compromise, there is scope for a consensus for in the world when it comes to figuring out the key challenges and the G20. Because if there was no communique in the G20 this time in Delhi in September, then the G20 process would have been as good as dead. So it was basically revived from almost the ICU. So that was the big, big takeaway for me from 2023's G20 summit. And Shubhajit, we've spoken about a number of things that will continue to remain a challenge and concern in 2024. Our ties with Canada and the US, the Israel-Hamas and the Russia-Ukraine war, our tensions with China. But talk about some of the other things that India will have to deal with in 2024. Well, it's a year of election in the region as well as in the world. There are more than 50 countries are going for elections, but closer home. Bangladesh elections is the first which India has to see that, uh, uh, you know, to for the stability of the region and in Bangladesh and because it's a neighboring country with whom India shares the border. So whoever wins Sheikh Hasina or is most likely, you know, set to win because the main opposition is not participating in the elections in this time. So that stability or continuity is likely to help India's sort of attention towards uh, connectivity with northeastern region as well as in the sub-regional groupings like BIMSTEC and uh, other such groupings in the region. So that is one major election that we should watch out for. The other will be the elections, of course, in Pakistan. Taiwan elections, I already talked about how the outcome again will show whether there'll be escalation in in tension between US and China. And a bit uh, away are, again in February, there'll be elections in Indonesia, which is uh, the largest Muslim country in the world by population. And that will also see the trade relationships and everything going forward. A bit away and the bigger elections are obviously the US elections and the UK elections in the UK to in the later part of the year. Obviously, the US elections between the Democrats and the Republicans, the outcome will definitely have a global impact, whether Trump or Republicans come back to power or Democrats are able to continue for the next term, for another term. And in the UK, it seems the conservatives are facing the biggest anti-incompetency and uh, from uh, the electorate after almost more than a decade of being in power. And um, the Labour Party has an edge as of now. So again, the outcomes will also determine India's sort of engagement with UK. All these elections, all this change of you know leaders will actually influence global 
power politics and diplomacy in 2024. So from that perspective, 2024 is a hugely, hugely consequential year for global diplomacy. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was written and produced by me, Shashank Bhargav, and was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at IndianExpress.com.